Hi everybody, Art Swift with Esperanto Technologies here. Hey, I am delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you today about a new design with more than a thousand low power RISC V cores packed on a single chip for accelerating machine learning in the hyperscale data center. Let's jump in. So it was uh, three years ago that our founder and chairman, Dave Ditzel, presented a paper at the seventh RISC V workshop which laid out the vision for Esperanto and what we wanted to do. Uh, here's a picture of Dave with his uh, mentor and uh, former professor, Dave Patterson, uh, at the, at the uh, workshop, uh, which was at uh, Western Digital in Milpitas. Now, I think everybody knows that uh, Dave and Dave together were the co-authors for the original Case for Risk paper, a highly influential paper, which in some ways kicked off uh, the risk revolution. Now, in Dave's uh, workshop talk that day about the vision for Esperanto, he talked about laying down 4,000 or more cores on a single device and uh, how you would go about it by staying close or doubling down on risk principles and risk five. So the vision he laid out was that, of course, uh, risk instruction set, a simple risk instruction set uses fewer gates, which results in a less complex design, fewer transistors, smaller die size, and of course, reduced dynamic and static power. But he also laid out the need for uh, innovation, which is enabled by RISC-V. So uh, he talked about adding machine learning specific instruction set extensions, doing custom microarchitecture, and applying proprietary low power design techniques, which are only possible if the design is uh, not overly complex. And finally, Dave talked about leveraging the broad and growing ecosystem that uh, RISC-V brings to the party. So I'm delighted to tell you that uh, the decision to use RISC-V was a good one for us. And in the three ensuing years, we've raised $77 million of venture capital. And now we're at the point of having completed our first design, the first of a family of AI processors based on RISC-V. So RISC-V was really key to uh, us getting this far. Let's jump into the actual design. So here's a die plot of the first chip in our family. Uh, we call it ETSOC1 ET for supercomputer on chip one. Uh, it's a thousand plus RISC V uh, custom cores with 23.8 billion transistors on seven nanometer technology from TSMC. It's targeted for uh, hyperscale data center applications, particularly uh, inferencing. Now we haven't seen first silicon yet, so I'm about to share with you data based on emulation. And so I'm sure you all know that uh, uh, emulation is a technique that allows you to run the full RTL, in other words, the full logic of the chip design on uh, basically big supercomputer boxes so that you can then run real uh, workloads. So based on uh, running full chip emulation on our eight Zebu boxes, so we're able to fit the entire chip design on these uh, uh, eight boxes, we're able to count cycles uh, for real workloads. Now, of course, performance is lower, uh, these big machines are much slower than uh, real chips are, but we're still able to run real workloads and to count uh, cycles with good accuracy. And what we find, which is really interesting, when we measure our performance versus the actual measured performance of uh, the incumbent solutions in the data center, uh, we're measuring ours on, in emulation, we're measuring theirs physically, we find that we expect to deliver 50 times better performance on key workloads like recommendation networks and up to 30 times better than the incumbents for image classification. But probably more exciting and more important is the energy efficiency which we're able to derive. We expect to see 100 times better energy efficiency in terms of inferences per watt than the incumbent solutions. Now, why is this important? Well, obviously it reduced uh, uh, cost, energy consumption costs in the data center, which are a key component. But more importantly, uh, energy efficiency dictates how much performance you can get out of the data center. If I have 100 times more efficient uh, architecture in terms of uh, inferences per watt, I can get 100 times more performance in a given footprint, so uh, for a given data center. Another key thing is the future-proofing that uh, our architecture provides. This is a general purpose architecture with a traditional memory hierarchy. It's fully programmable. It leverages a large open source community. And basically, it protects the uh, customer from uh, evolve evolution of uh, models, as this is a general purpose architecture. 
So one last point on this, uh, you note the regularity of the architecture there on the left. So it's a tiled solution and it's designed to scale up to more thousands of cores or scale down to hundreds of cores. So basically it's easy for us to build a family of devices for different application scenarios. So from you know, hyperscale data centers all the way down to uh, edge data centers and uh, near edge AI applications. Let's look at the core processing element first. So ET Minion is the basis of uh, the design. It's, we have, uh, you know, 1,088 or so of those on the device. ET Minion is a uh, RISC-V integer pipeline, 64-bit. It's an in-order pipeline. Um, it's got uh, two threads, so it's a multi-threaded design. And as you can see, uh, in terms of its overall area, which we show here in relative scale, it's about a third of the entire design. The memory is configurable, as you see throughout, um, which makes things interesting. It's very optimized for low power operation. Everything we've done with this uh, integer pipeline is around low power. We have fewer gates per stage, uh, such that we can have uh, better megahertz at lower power. We use special memories. Uh, the memory hierarchy allows us to uh, use special low power memories. And when I talk about uh, low voltage operation, I really mean operating at much lower than uh, nominal voltages. So if nominal is 0.75 volts or so, uh, we're operating you know, on the order of uh, 400 millivolts. Now the heavy lifting in the design is done by the uh, custom vector tensor unit that we've designed. And so uh, you can see here on the, the right side, the vector tensor unit, it makes up about uh, two thirds of the area of the minion core. And we have uh, a 256 bit wide floating point interface, 512 bit uh, int eight, interface, and we do both uh, 32 and 16-bit uh, floating, point, floating point multiply accumulates. So uh, again, this delivers a tremendous amount of performance and uh, a relatively good area. And uh, of course, we've added some uh, cool vector transcendental instructions that help with uh, the key machine learning workloads. Now, when we're doing these new multi-cycle tensor instructions, for instance, these could be hundreds of cycles long and we actually put the integer pipeline to sleep to save power. This is just one of the many tricks that we're using to uh, optimize energy efficiency. Bottom line is that each of these ET minions can deliver 128 giga ops int eight per gigahertz. So at one gigahertz, you'd have 128 ops. Now, just to make the math easy, if you had a thousand cores on a chip, uh, that would be one tera op per giga gigahertz peak. Now what we do next is we put 32 of these ET minions uh, CPUs together with four megabytes of uh, SRAM to form a minion shire. And here's a picture of a shire on the right. You can see uh, four eight core neighborhoods. So four of these neighborhoods totaling 32 minion CPUs talking through a crossbar to the banks of memory and connected to other shires by a mesh interconnect. So the Key thing here is the memory hierarchy is also software configurable. Uh, L1 can be either data cache or scratch pad. L2, 4 meg L2 can be configured as private L2, as L3 or scratch pad. The shires are all mesh connected with the uh, network on chip and we've added synchronization primitives to keep uh, everybody aligned across the chip. So let's build it up one more level. Uh, here's what uh, you know, block diagram of how the chip looks. And in total, there's 1,089 ET minions and four ET maxions in seven nanometer. So you might ask, wow, that's a weird number. How, how come 1,089? Well, there's 34 minion shires. And so that results in 1,088 ET minion processors and a total of 136 megabytes of memory. But there's one extra. There's a, a service processor, so that uh, makes it 1,089. Now, what about the Maxions? Well, we've talked about Maxion in a prior summit event. Uh, we did some early disclosure. Maxion is a high performance out of order CPU, multi-issue. Um, and basically its job is in a self-hosted environment to be the, uh, you know, the control processor that's running Linux and is actually supervising all the others. Now, typically we sit next to, uh, in initial designs, we sit, sit next to an Intel uh, host CPU, uh, either a Xeon or an AMD uh, server processor. 
And so these uh, Maxium processors are less important in a, for instance, in a hyperscale uh, hosted environment. But when we get to edge AI applications or near edge, then the Maxions become much more important because uh, you can't afford to have an expensive uh, Xeon processor sitting next to the accelerator. So these will be used for self-hosting. We support uh, PCIe Gen 4, eight lanes. Of course, we have all the security features, secure root of trust and so on. And then finally, I wanna point out that we use, uh, unlike many of our competitors, we use low power DDR4X uh, memory. So you can see we have two of the DRAM controllers on the, on the chip and we support up to 32 gigabytes of external DRAM. Now, each of these uh, DRAM interface, this DRAM interface is 256 bits wide and delivers 137 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. So you might ask, well, why didn't you go with a higher performance memory? Like, why didn't, why didn't you use HBM like some of the competitors do? Well, honestly, HBM uh, would have not worked for us. It would have been much too expensive, much too uh, power hungry, and uh, wouldn't deliver the kinds of uh, the actual bandwidth that we need. So in order to fit under 20 watts, uh, we have to use you know, some clever techniques, but we still need to deliver pretty high performance. So with a 20 watt typical operating power, we can actually fit six of our chips on a single PCIe card. And then this is the 256 bit interface I was just talking to you about that connects to external LPDDR4 DRAM. But each of these interfaces is actually four channels of uh, 16 bits. So you're actually getting 192 gigabytes, uh, access to 192 gigabytes of memory here. And then if you multiply that by six across the entire chip, you have this huge memory interface that's delivering 822 gigabytes per second of energy efficient bandwidth that's also very low cost. So the key takeaway for us is that by putting uh, multiple chips on a board, instead of one big hot chip, you actually get a much more cost effective and energy efficient design that still performs very well. So here's what it looks like in real life. So the red card that you see underneath, this is a Glacier Point OCP card. So an open compute platform uh, production card called Glacier Point V2. And on Glacier Point, we can put six of our Esperanto modules. Here, these are, these are unpopulated modules, obviously. The chip, our chip goes in the middle and the uh, DRAMs go around these edges. So we put three of these uh, modules on one side of the Glacier Point, three on the other. And basically that then delivers the 6,000 plus cores, 192 gigabytes of DRAM, and 822 gigabytes of DRAM bandwidth. Now I want to point out too that I, I hope you remember that these uh, RISC-V cores are multi-threaded. So we actually have lots of threads available to uh, take advantage of the memory size and memory bandwidth. Glacier Point is an open source uh, card. So this red card has been open sourced. You can you can build your own or uh, buy it through an open compute provider. And uh, this is a whole strategy that we have is to leverage as much possible the open source community. So again, uh, if you do the math, it's greater than 800 teraops into eight uh, if we're operating at one gigahertz. This is peak performance. Obviously, application specific uh, performance will vary, but as I showed earlier, it looks really, really good based on emulation full chip emulation as compared to the incumbents. Now, one other cool thing is that because Glacier Point is a production card and fits in a production uh, infrastructure, it's pretty easy for us to scale up our business. So here's uh, six of our chips that would fit on the uh, Glacier Point V2 card. The card then fits into the Yosemite V2 server sled. So that has two uh, Xeon processors and two accelerator cards. And then four of those sleds fit in a cubby, and then eight of the cubbies fit in a rack. So if you just uh, look at what a typical data center might have and use a, uh, what kind of square footage a typical data center might have, and a look at typical square footage per OCP rack, you actually get really high volumes pretty quickly because uh, you know a typical large data center might have uh, 4,000 or more racks per data center. So anyway, it, it turns out to be a very uh, attractive business opportunity for us as well. And again, energy efficiency is everything. If you can get more performance out of the footprint, energy footprint of a typical data center, that's a huge win. 
Software-wise, we support all the common uh, machine learning frameworks. Uh, we leverage the open source project uh, GLOW, which is the uh, Facebook uh, graph lowering technology, which they open sourced a couple of years ago and named us as a partner. So we interface uh, to GLOW from all the major models through Onyx or natively through PyTorch and C++. Now, the coolest thing about GLOW is, at least in my opinion, is it divides the machine learning workload across N chips. So in our case, across six chips. And then what we do is we take that intermediate representation and we do the hardware dependent optimizations for our chip and then uh, let the instructions down to the runtime and through the device drivers. And the GLOW runs on the host side. So we also provide all the development tools, management utilities, and so on that are required to deploy machine learning at scale. But for us, leveraging Glow to access the major uh, frameworks along with uh, PyTorch native uh, was, you know, made our development task uh, much more straightforward. Now, I've tried to point out that our architecture is uh, very balanced in terms of performance and energy efficiency and uh, memory and bandwidth. And we think this is really essential for you know, the key uh, hyperscaler workloads. So uh, there's a recent paper by Facebook that assessed relative importance, at least for them in their hyperscaler applications of these different uh, workloads. Recommendation came in as the most important for them. And as you can imagine why recommendation is the basis of uh, their profit model. And you know, a typical example here is a DLRM, the deep learning recommendation model, which is now uh, going into the ML perf benchmarking. So what's interesting about recommendation is it requires a mix of memory intensive and compute intensive capability. Uh, computer vision uh, is a, another key uh, workload, but it's uh, probably much more intensive on pure compute. And so a lot of people have optimized on you know, convolutions and uh, uh, gems for uh, computer vision. And perhaps that has been uh, counterproductive for a broad applicability across many applications. Another category that's important, of course, is BERT, and uh, that has, again, a mix of uh, requirements in terms of uh, memory and compute intensity. So there's a wide variety of models. There's both memory intensive and compute intensive and dense and sparse memory uh, requirements. And there was an ad admonition from uh, the author of the Facebook paper that said, don't optimize for gems and convolutions, basically saying it's going to be counterproductive for you because you're not going to perform well across a broad base of uh, applications. So we've worked really hard on designing a balanced solution for both dense compute uh, and large sparsely accessed memory. So we think this is really critical for future-proofing the design. So we feel that uh, we're gonna do a great job of meeting the key AI inferencing challenges for hyperscale data centers. I mean, you have to deploy at scale. Uh, today, it's a real challenge for the uh, companies because they're mostly deployed on legacy architectures. And these legacy architectures are limited in terms of their uh, scalability and other uh, future needs with the evolving models. So at Esperanto, our goal has been to deliver the required performance and power efficiency, an ease of programmability with a general purpose design, a balanced system that runs a number of algorithms well, and that you know, obviously don't lock hyperscalers into just one or two uh, legacy suppliers. Now, I just remind everybody with the scale, uh, the scalable and tiled nature of our design, it's very easy for us to build a whole family of products that span from hyperscale data centers to edge AI and uh, everything in between. So with that, let me uh, thank some of our key development partners. Uh, first of all, the RISC-V community has been great to us. Uh, thank you, everyone, who's uh, helped us in any way. Uh, our partners, uh, Synopsys on the tool side and uh, uh, emulator side, along with uh, uh, the addition of many of their consultants to our team, uh, TSMC, our fab vendor, and then a number of other parties who've helped us along the way. So thank you to everyone who's been involved. And I uh, can't name everybody. There's uh, several who haven't made this list. But again, uh, thank you very much for all your help in bringing our vision into reality. So with that, I'll stop and uh, open the floor to questions. Thank you very much.